I'm going to be in the um, book of uh, Luke this morning. If you want to open up your Bibles to Luke 18. You know how kids get fixated on stuff? Uh, you know, throw me again, 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 again. You know, they get fixated and they just want to do the same thing over and over and over again. Um, kids get fixated on stuff, a certain friend, a certain toy, a certain TV show. Teenagers get fixated on stuff. Um, now, you know, it used to be that the telephone had a long curly tail and was attached to the wall. Uh, now, kids, they're attached to their thumbs. And I heard, I heard this weekend that, that kids, and some adults, it's not just the kids, kids can scroll through uh, over 350 feet of news feed every day with their thumb, like that. You know how Schwarzenegger was huge here, here, and here? Our kids are going to be ginormous right here. Kids get fixated on stuff. Uh, we all get fixated on things. When I was a college student, I got fixated. Me and my friends, we would, uh, we would play cards every night. Uh, I watched the movie Red Dawn about 127 times. Not the new cruddy one, but the one with Swayze. You put some respect on that movie. You're feeling me. But kids are the worst at getting fixated on things. Okay? Uh, I have two boys, Jackson and Grant. Jackson, when he was little, got fixated on uh, Barney. On uh, the, on the oh, nightmare. When you spend it. We had... Uh, in the car, like the little hide and right kid, he would go nuts in the car. You play that tape, and he would just chillax. And then we'd have to go home and watch it. It was awful. And yeah, and uh, you know the same, the same TV shows, the same books. I must have read the Berenstain Bears old hat, new hat about five thousand times. Um, I could get to the point where I could say that entire book by memory in one breath. <sighs> Old hat, new hat, red hat, blue hat, blah, 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 blah. And it was this little board book, and I would go steamrolling through. And then just to make it interesting, I would start flipping multiple pages, and Jackson would catch me <laughs> and make me go back. Grant had a different fixation. Grant was uh, fixated on Veggie Tales. Um, Grant had a cup we got for Christmas one year of Bob the Tomato. And uh, Grant must have been, oh, maybe, maybe a year, maybe two. Uh, and so uh, he couldn't even really pronounce Bob, but he said, Ba? And he would hold his little Bob cup and he went around the room showing everybody his Bob cup. Uh, the little Lifeway Christian bookstore right next to uh, where we would do our shopping had the windows painted with Bob and Larry from Veggie Tales, And we would drive by there on purpose. Grant, look, Grant, look, there's Bob, there's Bob. And he would get so fixated, we'd drive by on purpose. Bob, 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 Bob. Uh, I heard a story from a uh, radio host about their son, his son, who got fixated of all the, of all the weird fixations. He, he got fixated on trash, on garbage. Okay? So he would go around the house collecting trash, and then he would just drag it around with him. So he'd go and get the trash can, and he'd uh, grab the bag out of there, and he would drive around, and he'd just drag the trash around. And then he would get to where he was going and sit down. He'd go through the trash. He'd take it out and he'd put stuff out. And he'd go. When you were driving around town, heaven forbid the kid saw a trash truck. He would make mom and dad follow the trash truck, would get all starry eyed. And you know those things smell, right? He'd make mom and dad follow him around. And he would call out the trash being dumped out of the trash cans that we all lug out to the curb. And as, 
as the machine would dump it into the back of the trash truck, the kid would just be fascinated by the things that he wrecked. Oh, there's a pizza box. Oh, oh, there, and he'd just start calling stuff out. But one day when one day when the kid was just dragging around his trash, the dad thought, I'm gonna do a little experiment. So he had the boy come and sit down. He reached into his pocket and he pulled out a $50 bill. And he said, whatever the kid's name is, let's call him Alex. Alex, Alex, you like that trash, don't you? Yeah, I like the trash. Why do you like the trash so much? I don't know. I tell you what, Alex, I'll give you $50 for the trash. Trade me. Give me $50. I'll give you $50 if you'll give me the trash right now. And the kid wouldn't do it. Why? Kid doesn't, know the, the kid doesn't know the value of $50, but he liked his trash. So he would go around. The, I don't know how the kid grew out of it. The kid could be in college now, you know, <laughs> dragging around his friends, you know, going to the fraternity house, you know, dragging people's trash around. But you know how we get fixated on stuff? This kid was fixated, locked in on what he liked. He liked it. It was his. So since that makes complete sense, let's go to Luke 18. Okay? I want you to see this story this morning. Jesus knew this was a loaded question. Okay, even in the way this young man addressed Jesus, a young Jewish ruler, a young Jewish uh, smarty smart, would, uh, would use that name good only in reference to God. Only God is good. The Pharisees would say only God is good. Only the law is good. This young man comes along, looks at Jesus and says, good teacher. He gave him a loaded name. Jesus calls him out on it. Why do you call me good? Jesus said. He spoke the guy's language. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. I left a part out. A certain rich young ruler, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All of these things I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was wealthy. Other gospel writers said, and he walked away. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this said, well, then who can be saved? They, in this day, they equated riches with God's blessing. The guy was rich because obviously God favored him. The guy was rich because obviously he was playing by the rules. The guy was rich because he was doing things to deserve God's pleasure and God's blessing. Sometimes today we're a little sketchy on that. We either attribute goodness to riches or evil to riches. Neither is true. Right? We all know that, right? There's nothing great about being rich folk. There's nothing bad about being rich folk. And conversely, there's nothing holy and admirable about being dirt poor. And there's nothing inherently holy about being dirt poor. We can all find ourselves on the scale of good and evil, at, on any scale of wealth and poverty. In this day, though, people would look on this man with favor. Obviously, he has God's favor because he has so much. God has favored him. He is good. He is a rich ruler. And he's come to God. What must, he's come to Jesus. What must I do to receive eternal life? And Jesus said, you've got a lot. 
take what you have, sell it, and give it to the poor, and then come and follow me, and you'll have eternal life. In a sense, Jesus sat him down, pulled out $50, and said, I'll tell you what, you give me your bag of trash, and I'll give you 50 bucks. And there had to have been a pause. And the young man thought. I don't know how long he thought. But eventually he turned and walked away, dragging his trash with him. He'd rather keep, he'd rather keep what he had than let it go and follow Jesus. You know, Jesus had made that invitation before, right? He had made it to fishermen. He had made it to tax collectors. In fact, he made the same invitation to a terrorist. We don't call him the terrorist very much. We fancy that word up and we call him the zealot, Simon. Simon the zealot. Actually, you read between the lines there, and it's Jewish terrorist is what he really was. And he had made these invitations. Guys, come and follow me, come and follow me, come and follow me. But to follow me, you've got to leave your stuff behind. I can't have you come and follow me and drag everything with you. It's going to slow you down. It's going to weigh you down. It's going to bog you down. You're not going to be able to follow me. You're not going to be able to go where I want you to go if you're just dragging it around. Jesus loved this young man. I want you guys to know this morning. It's my belief, and I think I can back this up scripturally, that however many people are breathing in and breathing out this morning, however many are walking around God's earth this morning, there are seven point something, something, something billion of us today. There are seven billion children of God, and He loves every one of them. They are Christian, Muslim, Jewish, atheist. Now, many of them don't know Him. And I'm not, I'm not putting them in heaven and hell this morning. Don't, don't mistake me. But they are each God's children. God loves every one of them. So if God loves them, we need to love them. God loved this man. Jesus loved this man. Jesus' invitation to him was sincere. Jesus didn't give this invitation to everybody. Remember the crazy guy who Jesus healed him of the demons in his head? And cleaned him up, clothed him, and then the, the guy wanted to follow Jesus, and Jesus wouldn't let him. Jesus said, no, go home and tell everybody what has happened to you. Go, go back home. So this invitation that Jesus gives this rich ruler wasn't made to everybody. But he makes the invitation, go, take everything that is weighing you down. Take whatever it is that you are dragging around behind you. Take it, sell it. Give it to the poor, then come and follow me. And however long it took him to think about it and consider it, the price was too high. He wanted his stuff more than he really wanted to follow Jesus. So as Joe and I were talking about this this week, Joe just says, and Joe, Joe's, Joe's more wise than you think. Amen. Joe just real low key went, what's in your bag? which I wrote down, and I'm now going to pass it off as my own. Thank you very much. <laughs> What's in your bag? When Jesus comes and says, take whatever is weighing you down, take whatever you are dragging around behind you, take whatever your, your baggage is, your old stuff, your old sin, your success, your prestige, the control that you think you have, your toys, your riches, your talents, all the things that puff you up, all the things that you think define you, all that stuff. I want you to lay that down. And then I want you to come and follow me. For some of you this morning, and I'm going to get to this, there's so many things. I think we've been together about eh, 20 weeks, 25 weeks. I've, I'm up to here with things that I want to preach, and I've got to I've got 25 minutes a week. It's driving me nuts. But one of these days, we're going we're gonna to talk again about forgiveness. We did that when we talked about prayer. 
Forgiveness is something that we continue to often drag around behind us, unforgiveness of each other. We refuse to let go of forgiveness when someone has wronged us. They are just living life. Often they've not thought of you for months or years, right? But that unforgiveness that we keep that, we just drag that around everywhere we go. Sometimes it's, it's our titles, the power that we think we have. You know, I've seen, I've, I've seen people who are, are CEO, CFO type people of million dollar industries and they are sometimes not nearly as puffed up to somebody who's a 9 and 10 year old Dixie baseball coach. Because whatever it is that puffs you up, you just, you just, you just walk with a little bit more of a strut. Okay, and that title defines you. It doesn't have to be anything really big and important. Sometimes a wife will lord over her husband or a husband will lord over his wife. And that title, that power that they think they have, they, they would rather cling to that than truly set it down and follow Jesus. Your past, your sin, stuff that was forgiven a long time ago, you cannot freely follow Jesus to the full because you are continuing to drag that around with you. And it slows you down. And Jesus came to this man and said, Buddy, I can see right through you. You're defined by what you got. You think it makes you more than you are. And you refuse to let go of your trash. Because all that, riches, all that riches will do will give you a pretty great life with the things that money can buy. Money can't buy happiness, but money can buy donuts and hockey tickets and chicken wings <laughs> and Walt Disney World and a swimming pool and a motorcycle that would fall over and kill me dead. <laughs> money can't buy us happiness, but money can sure buy a lot of things that will make us happy for a while. Jesus sees right through that and says, Buddy, I've got a trade for you. I've, I've, I've got something better I want to offer you. But for me to truly give you what I want to give you, you've got to give me the stuff that you've been dragging around. What's in your bag this morning? What is it? What, what, what did you drag in here? That Jesus invites you to follow him. Jesus says, come and follow me. Put down the stuff that you think is you. Lay it down. Lay that, lay that shame and guilt. Lay that past. Lay those toys down. Lay your title down. Lay your, lay your privilege down. Whatever it is that you are lugging around behind me, I've got something better for you. Jesus offers us life, life to the full. See, whatever's in your bag, it, it's yours. It, you, you can keep it. You know, all that unforgiveness that we drag around, I, I sometimes think that all that, all that unforgiveness that we, that we Christians can lug around, it just keeps us warm at night. You know, all that anger, and I won't use the word hatred, but hatred, all that stuff that we lug around, and Jesus says, come and follow me, it just kind of keeps, it, it's ours. It's ours. We love it. We want to keep it with us. We want to lug it along with us everywhere we go. Jesus says, I want something way better for you. I want you to come and follow me. And the Bible says that the rich man didn't. He came with the great question, even though he loaded it up a little bit with a little flattery there. He said, what must I do to inherit life, to inherit eternal life? What must I do? Now that's... We don't do anything to inherit life. 
But at least he was asking the question. He comes and says, Jesus, what must I do? Jesus answers him the same way he answers you here today. Whatever it is that you're dragging along behind you, and it's different for each one of us, whatever it is that you're dragging along, would you trade it for what Jesus wants to give you? For some of you, it's addiction. Addiction to a hundred different things, but addiction. For some of you, it is sin, willful sin. I would rather have this, this lifestyle, this thing that I want that God has said that he doesn't want for me. I would rather have this than follow Jesus. And you can't have both. Unforgiveness, the shame of the past. Folks, Jesus has come and invited you today and said, follow me. Leave all the stuff behind and follow me. You've been issued that invitation today. And I believe the Holy Spirit's working on some of you. You can name right now. I can't for you. But you can name what's inside your trash bag. Whether it's sin, whether it's the shame of old stuff, whether it's habit and addiction, are you willing to lay that down? I want us to pray together this morning, and I'd ask you to stand with me. Spirit will help you to see what's yours, if you'll ask him. God, what is it that is in my life that's holding me back from truly following you? What is it that I refuse to let go of that will help me come and follow you? God, would you show us today? Jesus has come and offered us life, life more abundantly, life to the full. And I want you to get a real clear picture today. If you don't follow him today, I hate this about, I hate this about Jesus, but Jesus let the guy walk away. In my head, I want Jesus to follow him up and say, no, 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 don't go, don't go. Hey, don't, don't go. Let me explain it again. Let me convince you. But he didn't. Sadly, he allowed to, man to walk away. And he walked away dragging his trash bag full of money. He had what he wanted most. Instead of trading it for what Jesus wanted to give him. Would you pray with me this morning? Let's pray together. Father, help us to do some self-examination this morning. And as we pause and pray, Help us, Jesus, to realize what it is that keeps us truly from following you. And help us, Jesus, to be willing to lay that down. God, somebody here today can pray and find new life, life to the full. They can come and pray this morning at the altar. They can pray where they stand. They can sit. They can kneel. Even on the way home, God, that Spirit of God, that voice of God can continue to speak in our hearts and in our spirits and we can hear your voice saying, this is what I want you to let go. These, these habits, these addictions, this sin, this pride, this unforgiving spirit, this, this, this sense of conflict that is constantly with you. Help us, Lord, to cut things loose today and find life. Jesus, would you talk to us, speak to us. Identify in us the garbage that we're just dragging around behind us that keeps us from truly following you. Would you help us this morning? Amen.